Hello. We're going to continue our discussion of uh, international harvesters battles in the 1970s and 1980s with the discussion of, of ferric. This was uh, international harvesters sort of skunk works where all their engineering was done, all the testing, the prototypes was done. It's a place that has a lot of fascination with uh, uh, the people who love this topic because this is where all the secret stuff was built. Um, we're going to start our discussion uh, with a flashback to a clip from a former IH engineer named Ken Ryan who started his career as a young engineer in the early 1960s working at Ferrick. Uh, he has a great description of that. Then we're going to go on to our panelists who will take us behind the scenes of this piece of important international harvester history. And uh, it was a brand new beautiful facility. It was a dream, a college boy's dream to walk into that place. The labs and the engineering facility, you know, it was just, it was everything was just perfect. It didn't take three seconds to figure out where I was going to go to work. <laughs> <laughs> so Ferrick, uh, the building, has a tremendous amount of IH history. It was, this is, uh, this center was constructed on a 414 acre property that International Harvester owned in the Chicago area, it was on the uh, southwest side of Chicago. And that property was their experimental farm where many of their early prototypes were uh, tested. They had fields. Uh, many of the promotional photographs you see from back in the day, you see those grounds and the beautiful barn they had there. Um, and in fact, they introduced the um, 560 and 460, that line of tractors uh, in the late 1950s. There was a big introduction held right on those grounds where they uh, brought everybody in to see the new tractors. By the 1980s, uh, when we're talking about this facility, uh, it was, it was, uh, Ferrick was incredible. There was 400,000 square feet of both design offices and then facilities of labs where they could test tractors and fabrication facilities where they could build prototype tractors. So, another short clip about Ferrick, this from International Harvester's chief engineer uh, in the late 70s and 80s, Dr. Glenn Colley. And then we had a, a climate control and test chamber uh, that went down to 40 below and, and would start tractors at unbelievable temperatures and, and do all the tests on it. And then we had a uh, corrosion test for all electronics where we put it in salt baths and so glenn is talking about all the technology at fair do you guys have memories of of going to that that building was that some some place that you interacted with a lot oh absolutely i spent hours and hours primarily in the uh the coal chamber um as we had a combine that was pretty well ready to go to production one of the final checks was put the thing in there and you, you had a chance to do two things. One, you do the cold weather stuff, and you think, well, that's no big deal. You know, you get a big enough battery and a diesel engine. I mean, it, it's going to stop, no big deal. But in those days, we had relatively complex, for the time, relatively complex hydraulic systems. And in that cold weather, you could blow a hydraulic line in, in a flash if you didn't have your system uh, designed properly and all the all the elements sized properly. Then on the other side of it, you know, we'd go in and uh, turn the heat on, if you will, and uh, we would run at high temperatures, high horsepower levels, and understand engine cooling, hydraulic system cooling, and air conditioning. And those were some of the more challenging times. Of course, that was all done with clean air. There was no chaff, no dirt, no dust. So it, it, just because you got through the uh, high te temperature tests uh, in the lab successfully didn't necessarily mean you were going to be successful in the field because Mother Nature had a whole different thought process on uh, chaff and straw and dust. 
Uh, relative to the, the picture on the very left, the uh, semi-anechoic chamber, that was a noise chamber. And uh, that was built early on when, you know, uh, IH was big in the construction business. They could put a great big uh, mining truck in there. And you were able to, from inside the cab, determine where are the leaks, the noise leaks. Um, and the whole thing was, and you could also uh, understand uh, the noise around the vehicle. So from a pass-by perspective, you got a good benchmark. From a uh, operator's perspective, you got a good feel that you had something that was very reasonable. And, and again, the technology in those days wasn't anywhere close to what we have today. So a lot of it was experienced people using these very good tools, good tools for the time, making the very best solutions uh, that we could make. And uh, by and large, it was quite successful. I mean, it wasn't the final answer, but it was a uh, an answer on the road to the final version. To Dan's point, uh, this is, was an, also an excellent place uh, to take uh, key customers as well as our dealers. I mean, it, we didn't do a lot of it, but when we did uh, this whole process, whether it, heat and cold, noise, or hydraulic, it, it really impressed them. And um, uh, that was uh, not only leverage at Hinsdale, but also at our plants where they could see how our equipment was developed and how it was built. That engineering center was a major place and probably didn't realize it at the time, but even now uh, at the uh, truck division, International Trucks, uh, we started working on emissions before the farm equipment business did because of on highway engines. And I remember in about uh, 2010, uh, we had some issues with uh, some of the early production uh, SCR trucks that required uh, DEF uh, starting issues in cold weather. And we literally had to borrow. And of course, Case was nice enough. Case CNH was nice enough to let us borrow the cold room at Burr Ridge to put our trucks in and validate uh, the, uh, the starting aid we had to use at that time. So uh, the, that facility was built, I think it was opened in 1959. The property was purchased in like 1919, 18 by Alexander Legg. There's so much history. That's probably something that could, a book be written about, uh, Lee, about the history there at Hinsdale. The town was named Harvester. The Burr Ridge was named Harvester at one time. But uh, that engineering center, I, I was really saddened to hear that they're, they're moving out now and doing other things. Which life goes on, progress occurs, but uh, that was a major facility. Yeah, that yep. incredible place and so much interest and so much uh, so much happened there. Um, one of the favorite stories I heard was that they had uh, in the 90s, they had fully automated tractors running around the yard of that. I don't know if you guys, I had one of the engineers tell me that they had that technology built that early, that uh, early 90s that that was running. Well, actually, yeah, was... I've seen pictures, Lee, of uh, automated uh, remote control tractors from the 40s. Yeah. Yeah, the radio controlled ones. Yeah. Radio controlled, they, yes. Uh, yes, I have. Yeah, it's fantastic how early. Yeah. So this engineering facility played a huge role in harvester history and in fact helped save the company's technology. Um, Literally during the merger played a key role in that. Uh, Dr. Glenn Colley tells that story in my book, Red Tractors. I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, thanks for your time. Next week, we will be talking about 1979, a really critical year in international harvester history. Thanks a lot for your time. 1979 is about as fascinating a year as you can get in IH. 